Chapter 5. Condition of Barracks The rapid increase in the population of the prison camp during August made it impossible for Colonel Eastman to provide comfortable care for all on such short notice. That he was cognizant of the situation and made every possible effort to correct it at once is indicated by the official correspondence which follows, clearly proving that whatever discomfort the prisoners did experience in the beginning was shared by the guards as well and that the machinery of the government did not move fast enough to correct the existing conditions as rapidly as the commanding officer desired. This same factor appears in other cases, notably that of the stagnant pond and the ditch to relieve it. Colonel Eastman was ready to dig it two months before the government got around to giving him the necessary authority. Those two months meant much to the history of the camp and the lives of the prisoners. But the commanding officer cannot be blamed in any way for the delay. In fact, there is much excuse for the commissioner for prisoners not being directly on the ground and being pressed on all sides with matters of equally great importance. Things naturally had to be taken up in their turn. Unfortunately, the subject of the ditch got buried under the mass and it took a long time to get to it. When finally it reached the surface, it was handled with expediency materially assisted by the persistent urgency of Colonel Tracy. Headquarters for Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York, August 7, 1864. Colonel William Hoffman, Commander General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C. Colonel, I am out of tents for prisoners of war, and I respectfully request that you will urge the Quartermaster General to forward a supply according to the requisition I forwarded to you a few days since before the next detachment of prisoners arrive here. Two of the wards for hospitals are so nearly completed that it is probable that they can be used for the sick in a day or two. It will be necessary to erect three more as soon as lumber can be obtained, and another mess room and kitchen. The mess room to see about 2,000. Shall old citizens' clothes be issued to the prisoners? There are some on hand that have been turned in by the provost marshals being clothing taken from deserters and others. Application has been made by one prisoner for permission to purchase a few shoemaker's tools and leather for the purpose of mending and making shoes for the prisoners. Shall it be permitted? Very respectfully, your obedient servant, S. Eastman, Lieutenant Colonel, USA, Commanding Depot. Office Commissary General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C., August 12, 1864. Lieutenant Colonel S. Eastman, Commanding Depot Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York. Colonel, your letter on the 7th instant is received. On the 9th instant, I requested the Quartermaster General to order the tents estimated for to be forwarded without delay. It is not expected that there will be mess rooms sufficient for all the prisoners to take their meals at once, and unless additional room is absolutely necessary, no more will be erected. Please report fully on this subject. The old citizen's clothing, which you mentioned, may be issued to prisoners if it is not of a color to disguise them as Union citizens. Only gray, or some shade of gray mixed, can be allowed. A prisoner cannot be allowed to purchase tools and leather for repairing shoes. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, W. Hoffman, Colonel, 3rd Infantry, and Commanding General of Prisoners. Headquarters Depot for Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York, August 28, 1864. Colonel W. Hoffman, Commanding General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C. Colonel, I have the honor to state that the mess room and the kitchen for prisoners of war at this depot is too small to accommodate 10,000 men. The present mess room will seat from 1,600 to 1,800, and it requires from two to three hours to feed 10,000. By erecting another mess room and kitchen to accommodate 1,000 to 1,200, they can be fed in half that time. A mess room should also be made for the hospital. The surgeon has applied for it. There is a kitchen attached to the hospital and will be ready to use as soon as the stoves are put in, which will be done in two or three days. Three wards for the sick have been completed and a wash house. Three more wards are being built as fast as lumber can be obtained. When they are all up, they will be insufficient for the number of sick now on the sick list. I have also turned over to the surgeon in charge four barracks for hospital purposes. I would also request to be informed if any arrangement is to be made for winter quarters for prisoners of war and the troops now guarding them, 
who are intense. If so, it should be commenced immediately owing to the difficulty of obtaining lumber at this point. If temporary barracks are not to be erected, I should recommend that Sibley tents be supplied in lieu of the common tent now used. I am respectfully your obedient servant, S. Eastman, Lieutenant Colonel USA, Commanding Depot. Office Commander General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C., September 8, 1864. Lieutenant Colonel S. Eastman, Commanding Depot Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York. Colonel, your letter on the 28th, Ultimo, recommending additional mess rooms, etc., is received. If the prisoners can take their meals in the mess rooms as they now stand by taking three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon, no additions, indeed, if they can get through their breakfast by 11 a.m. and their dinner by 6 p.m., nothing more is necessary. You are authorized to put up such hospital wards as may be indispensably necessary to be built in the cheapest manner. They will not be plastered, but will be made as close as practicable by battening the joints of the weather boarding. Barracks for the guard, or additional ones for the prisoners, will not be put up at present. Sibley tents can be estimated for in October. Very respectfully yours, your obedient servant, W. Hoffman, Colonel 3rd Infantry and Commander General of Prisoners. The above represents practically the last official act of Colonel Eastman in connection with the prison camp. He was taken very sick soon after, and after two weeks, illness was relieved, September 20, 1864. Little is known about the history of Colonel Eastman. The advertiser says, Lieutenant Colonel S. Eastman came here from Cincinnati. The officers who served under him bear testimony to the system and order he was successful in establishing, as a proficient in those matters from experience in the regular army. He has had entire charge of the establishment of the prison camp, apparently to the entire satisfaction of the War Department. The friends of Colonel Eastman wish him merited success in his new field. As a successor to Colonel Eastman came Colonel Benjamin F. Tracy, at that time Colonel of the 127th Colored Infantry. At the time of his succession there were 9,508 prisoners in the camp. On September 29th, the advertiser says, quote, Colonel Tracy is inaugurating many changes and improvements. Barracks are to be erected at once to take the place of tents now in use, end quote. The three greatest topics of this history are barracks, food, and hospital, each of which has a direct bearing on the charges made against Elmira. They will now be taken up, as nearly as possible, in the order of their sequence. At the opening of the camp, there were 35 buildings in good order, previously used by U.S. troops, which were rapidly filled up, and by the end of August, there were 9,619 prisoners on hand. About one half were quartered in tents. Plate number two shows the situation at the beginning of October. During the month of September, no prisoners were received. Colonel Eastman's last communication shows that his mind was dwelling on the subject. He saw the winter coming and knew that common humanity made it expedient to give him early attention to the matter. Colonel Hoffman's reply contributes nothing but cold comfort. With a new and vigorous officer at the helm, the aspect changes. Under date of September 25th, Captain Munger, in his inspection report, says, quote, Some clothing is received daily from the friends of prisoners, but there's still great destitution. The weather is cold for the season, and those in tents especially suffer. There are no stoves in quarters or hospital, end quote. Colonel Tracy endorses on this report, quote, Many men are in tents without stoves or blankets. Barracks should be erected inside of tents. End quote. Washington, D.C., October 3, 1864. Colonel B.F. Tracy, Commanding Depot Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York. Colonel, by authority of the Secretary of War, you will order the erection of shed barracks for the prisoners of war at Elmira Depot. The lumber will be purchased with the prison fund. And as far as practicable, the work will be done by the prisoners. Selecting in preference when they have the capacity, those who have desired to take the oath of allegiance. You will require your quartermaster to make the purchases, direct the work, and pay the workmen, as if it were done under the direction of his department, but rendering the accounts as for other expenditures of the prison fund. A building 100 feet long and 22 feet wide will accommodate 120 men and give a room at the end of the 20 by 22 feet for a kitchen. 
The elevation from the floor should be 9 feet, and the floor should be high enough from the ground to prevent burrowing with a view to escape without detection. The roof should be covered with a patent felt roofing, which is much warmer than the shingle roof. Place the bunks in three tiers. I enclose a ground plan, which will explain how I wish the building arranged. Build it balloon fashion, no timber larger than 3 by 4 inches, except the joists for the floor 3 by 8. Set the post in the ground and board it in vertically with battens over the intervals on the outside, and fill them with clay plaster on the inside. Sawed lathing will do for battens. The floors must be made of rough boards, but they may be made close for winter by covering the intervals on the underside with sawed lathing. It will probably be necessary to employ an experienced carpenter to superintend the work, and if you can find carpenters in your command, they can be detailed and paid at the prescribed rates. Report the progress of the work weekly. Have you received any instructions in relation to barracks for the guards? Very respectfully, your obedient servant, W. Hoffman, Colonel, 3rd Infantry and Commanding General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C., October 15, 1864. Colonel B.F. Tracy, Commanding Depot, Elmira, New York. Colonel, you will take immediate measures to erect barracks for the depot guard. Say two regiments with the complement of officers. A building of the style directed for the prisoners, 160 feet long, will furnish quarters for two companies of 84 men each, giving each a room of 60 feet and a kitchen of 20 feet long, breadth 22 or 24 feet, according to length of lumber. Barracks for officers should be built in blocks for the officers of three or four companies together, located near the companies, rooms not to exceed 12 by 15 feet, two to a company, and a kitchen to each block. The lumber and other materials, and the hire of the workmen, will, as far as practicable, be paid out of the prison fund in the same manner as for prisoners' barracks. Should the fund be insufficient for the purpose, you will direct the quartermaster to make an estimate for what may be necessary to supply the deficiencies. The barracks will be built after the style of those directed for the prisoners, and in every way the closest economy will be studied. No plastering will be done except to fill up openings on the inside with clay. Very respectfully yours, your obedient servant, W. Hoffman, Colonel, 3rd Infantry and Commander of Prisoners. Under date of November 6th, Colonel Tracy endorses on Captain Munger's inspection report, quote, Barracks progress slowly. We have been delayed for want of timber. It is now being supplied and we hope to have no further delay, end quote. Under date of November 17th, the advertiser says, quote, New barrack buildings have been erected to take the place of tents, and stoves have been put in to burn coal. No pains will be spared to make living in the prison camp desirable, warm and healthful during the winter. End quote. Colonel Tracy reports to Colonel Hoffman under date of November 28th, quote, There are three new barracks occupied, four more begun. Mess hall, kitchen, and laundry completed. Coal stoves substituted for small wood stoves in hospital. Six old barracks set apart for convalescent wards, and the surgeon ordered to fit them up and use them as such. End quote. Under date of December 11th, Captain Borden, in his inspection report, says, quote, During the week, there were three buildings erected, the last of which is incomplete, not having lumber on hand to finish it. One of those which is completed is unoccupied, there being no stoves to put in it. End quote. Colonel Tracy endorses on this report, quote, stoves for new wards have been ordered and are expected in a few days, end quote. As the question of stoves and lack of heating and tents has been the subject of considerable controversy, especially in the charges against the prison camp, the following definite evidence is of great value. Elmira, New York, January 24th, 1912. Mr. Clay W. Holmes, Elmira, New York. Dear Sir, in 1864, I was in the employ of E.H. Cook & Company, Hardware Merchants, Corner Lake and Water Streets. They had a contract with Uncle Sam to furnish tin plates, cups, knives, forks, spoons, and other supplies for the camps, and to do all metalwork about the camps. A Mr. Whipple and I did all the metalwork, and we were in the Rebel Stockade a good part of the time. The firm sold for the prison camp 150 coal stoves, two for each building, with about 90 feet of stove pipe for each stove, 
and we put them all up. We also made a great number of sheet iron stoves for burning wood in the tents. We did all the metal work on the hospital buildings, bakery, and cookhouses. An amusing thing the Johnnies did when they first came was to erect a sundial in the center of the ground just off the main street to tell the time of day. Truly yours, James W. Craig. The author has known Mr. Craig personally for many years and can vouch for this statement as being accurate and absolutely dependable. It establishes the number of coal stoves in the camp and also the fact, which has been repeatedly denied, that the prisoners had stoves in the tents till they were transferred to barracks. Headquarters Depot for Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York, December 17, 1864. Brigadier General H.W. Wessels, Commissary General of Prisoners. Sir, in answer to your communication dated December 7, 1864, requiring estimate of cost of sealing hospital wards and prison camps, and to report also of the advantages to be derived from substituting coal stoves for wood, how many will be required and what can be done with the stoves displaced by substitution? I have the honor to report, first, that the probable cost of sealing hospital wards will be $3,500. The advantages of coal over wood are, first, it is more economical by one-fourth at least. It is more secure against fire, which I consider very important. If our barracks should get on fire, I do not see how we could prevent most of the camp from burning. There are 42 wood stoves to be replaced by coal stoves in old barracks. They can be used by the government where wood stoves are needed, but could be sold for little more than old iron. Deeming your instructions sufficient to warrant the sealing, I have commenced the work, and it is now being put on. I am very respectfully your obedient servant, B.F. Tracy, Colonel, Commanding Depot. This official history of the barracks shows that the commanding officer exercised every possible effort to construct proper barracks for the comfort of the prisoners. It clearly proves that barracks for prisoners were built before those for the soldiers on guard. Also that the government gave specific instructions that those for the guards should be exactly like those for the prisoners, a fact which should be taken carefully into account. No man can enter a just complaint that the prisoners were ill-treated in this matter so long as the United States troops guarding them were given exactly the same treatment. Sufficient barracks were constructed to house all the prisoners during the month of December. The matter of building them had been taken up as early as August 28th by Lieutenant Colonel Eastman and was vigorously followed up by Colonel Tracy, and they would have been completed long before they finally were, had it not been for the scarcity of lumber. When they were all finished, the Elmira prison camp was equipped with as good barracks as any prison in the country, and in the minds of those in a position to know, they were the best barracks to be found anywhere in the field or elsewhere, and certainly better quarters than were ever occupied by any of the Confederates in their own army life. The following letter by the Honorable H. H. Rockwell, one of Almire's most prominent citizens at the present time, a good soldier during the war, and after the war so well thought of by the citizens that he was sent to Congress, gives a clear and unbiased idea of the conditions existing in the prison camp as compared with those of our own soldiers in the field. Mr. Clay W. Holmes, Almira, New York. My dear Mr. Holmes, I am sending you a statement in writing of the facts which I stated to you verbally yesterday in regard to the prison camp at Elmira. I enlisted as a soldier in the War of the Rebellion in April 1861 and served in the 23rd Regiment New York Volunteers, a two-year regiment, until the expiration of its term of service in May 1863. After my return, I remained in Elmira until the fall of 1865 and during the whole period of the existence of the prison camp here. I spent two years as a private soldier in winter quarters in northern Virginia with the Army of the Potomac, both of which winters were very severe for that climate. We soldiers constructed our own winter quarters from the surrounding forests, nothing being furnished us except our tent cloths, which were used for roofs and the straw which was used for our beds. During the winter of 1863 and 64, I was in the employ of the United States Express Company in Elmira, and among my duties was the delivering of what we called sealed packages, that is, 
packages containing money and other valuables. These duties led me frequently to the prison camp, and I was able to observe the situation there. The quarters occupied by the prisoners were in every way much more comfortable and commodious than our own winter quarters above referred to. They consisted of large barrack buildings, built of good lumber, double-boarded, with tight roofs and good floors. Along either side were double rows of bunks furnished with straw ticks and blankets. The grounds were well policed and the quarters were clean and comfortable. The high board fences surrounding the camp made an excellent windbreak. The river and the open exposure to the south gave ample opportunity for sunshine to reach all parts of the grounds, and also for the disposal of the garbage and refuse from the camp. There was plenty of good hard wood, which was the ordinary fuel used by everybody in those days. The hills for miles around Elmira were denuded by their owners to furnish the barracks of the Union soldiers, and also the prison camp with wood, which brought a very high price and was purchased by the government in unlimited quantities. I had no opportunity to observe the rations, but never heard any complaints either as to their quality or quantity. There was a large hospital with a medical staff and plenty of medical and hospital supplies. I have seen quantities of oranges and other fruit, fresh eggs, oysters, crackers, etc., delivered at this hospital. Mr. William J. Lorimore of this city was then engaged in the wholesale grocer and liquor business, and from him I have learned that wines and liquors for the sick were furnished in abundance. I frequently saw large numbers of these prisoners as they detrained at Elmira and marched up to the prison camp. A large proportion of them were in poor physical condition on their arrival. They were sallow, emaciated, and weak, a condition which my experience leads me to believe was caused by hard campaigning and coarse and insufficient rations. In the matter of clothing, they were little better. Immediately after the establishment of the camp, both of the Masonic Lodges in Elmira passed resolutions appointing a joint committee to raise funds and ask for contributions of money and clothing, which were freely given and under the direction of this committee were distributed to such of the prisoners as were Masons. The committee was directed to investigate and find all such cases and relieve them according to their necessities, and this continued during the entire existence of the camp at this city. Although I never attended personally, I knew of the fact that Masonic funerals for deceased prisoners were held by the lodges, and such prisoners as were Masons were given Masonic burial. But I have no recollection as to how many instances of this kind there were. I know that there was a large mortality, but I'm sure this was not due to any lack of care or subsistence on the part of the authorities. There was an epidemic of smallpox among the prisoners, and pneumonia and other respiratory diseases were prevalent. This was natural. These prisoners were largely from South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, and other extreme southern states. The change from that climate to the severe climate of New York necessarily caused much of this sickness. It was further aggravated by the poor physical condition of the prisoners when they arrived. It should be borne in mind also that homesickness was naturally another factor. The fact that they were prisoners in a strange land, far from their homes and families, was naturally depressing. Yours very truly, H. H. Rockwell, 1913. There is no doubt that those of the prisoners who were unlucky enough to occupy tents before the new barracks were completed did suffer much from the cold, and it is also true that during the winter all the prisoners in the barracks suffered more or less from the cold. The reason for this was not because of any failure on the part of the officers in charge or of the government to make proper provision in every way for their comfort. The winter was one of the intense severity as the records will show. It began early. Snow came in October, a thing which does not happen once in a decade, and it was present all winter and up to March 15th. To the writer's knowledge, there have not been more than three winters since 1865 which would begin to compare with it in severity, and even then the severe weather has not been of long continuance. Usually there is little, if any, real winter before January or February. The present winter of 1911 through 12 has been the most severe in the knowledge of the oldest inhabitants, that is, for a continued period. It did not set in, however, till January, but from January 1st to March 15th, the thermometer seldom got far above zero. 
The continued cold carried the frost down more than six feet, and for the first time in the knowledge of the writer, the city service water pipes froze up. With it there has hardly been any snow, six inches being the heaviest fall in March. It was so cold that those living in the best-built houses, with abundance of coal and all improved appliances at hand, could not keep comfortable. Everyone suffered. Is it any wonder that the prisoners suffered? Sure it is that the citizens of Almira have complained as much of suffering from the cold this winter as ever did the prisoners of that other winter, just like it in 1864-65. through 65. And the government has been just as much to blame for our sufferings this winter as it was for the prisoners' sufferings in the barracks. It is manifestly unfair and unjust to charge nature's violence to any man or to the government. The following notes taken from the advertiser are proof of the facts stated. October 10th, cold weather set in for two days, snow on the hills. November 16th, wintry and snow. December 30th, heavy snow impeded railroad travel. January 6th, coldest night of the season, thermometer 18 degrees below zero. January 9th, Heaviest snowstorm of the season, 6 inches, ice on river 12 to 14 inches thick. January 11th, thaw and rain. February 7th, heaviest snow of winter, 18 inches, snow 30 inches deep on hills. February 15th, coldest night of season, 18 degrees below zero. March 2nd, another big snowstorm. March 10th, warm weather and rain. Had the winter been anything like the usual winters of the climate, the sufferings of the prisoners would not have been severe, or of a character justifying complaint as to their treatment. The officers and guards suffered quite as much, only they had this in their favor. They were more acclimated and better clothed. The question of the prisoners' condition as to clothing will be noted in the next chapter.